Well, yeah, go ahead and show your appreciation. That's fine. We can do that. It's part of our culture. And uh, I sang that song 40 years ago. Yeah, that's an oldie goldie. I saw some of you singing along. That's an old song. And uh, I traveled when I was in college and sang in a trio. And I appreciate that very, very much. If I got that microphone on, fellas, I think I do. It's on. Good. Turn me up just a little bit. I love to hear myself. I'm my favorite preacher. And um, if I can't hear myself, I, I think I'm not being heard by anybody. So you do that. I appreciate that very much. There we go. Excellent. Good. Well, it's great to be back in Pickerington, Ohio, south of Columbus, Ohio, living in the shadow of the great city of Columbus. Great to be back here. Had a great time last night. I got to go out to eat with the Three Stooges. You know who they are, don't you? Yeah. John, Nathan, and Jonathan. Wow. Let me just say that uh, kind of hard up for help around here. <laughs> we had a great time. Great time. The guy said, Preacher, we're going to take you to this awesome restaurant. Pastor said to treat you right expense out the window, whatever you want. And I got to tell you, that's probably the nicest McDonald's I've ever been to. So thank you for that. That was really nice. Now we went to another place. I forget the name of it now, but it was really a, kind of a pizza place and they had burgers and all kinds of stuff. And so the guy said, oh, this is the burger you want to get. You want to get this burger. And it was a great burger, it had pulled pork on it and, and a great French fries and all that good stuff. I hadn't eaten all day. I had a piece of toast in the morning and I just, I was driving. I just wanted to get here, didn't want to stop. So I drove and so I hadn't eaten all day. I ate that burger. I woke up at three o'clock this morning. I want to tell you when they say the preacher's on fire, I was on fire. I don't get indigestion very often. I had heartburn so bad. I thought I was going to die. So I'm ready to preach this morning. I, I got the fire of God inside me. And uh, usually I love milk. I'm a milk drinker. I can drink a gallon of milk about every two days if I really go at it. I love it. I could probably do a gallon of milk in a good sitting. You, you can't do it. Your stomach won't hold that much. But if you could, I could do it. So I, I was laying there last night. I thought, I've got to get some milk. I'm in, the, I'm in the motel, beautiful motel. I've got to get some milk. No milk. So the church had provided a great basket of, I mean, a big basket of just treats. And so I'm eating fish crackers. I'm eating cookies. I'm drinking sweet tea. I'm doing anything to get that acid to stop. And it worked and I feel great. But thanks guys for almost killing me. I appreciate that. And I'll not be going out with them again. Neither will they ever work in a church anywhere in Canada. So, uh, thank you for that. But no, that was very kind. And then pastor, congratulations on saying Newfoundland, right? Lynn, did you hear that? He got it. He nailed it. A lot of people say Newfoundland and it's kind of how it's spelled, but uh, that's not how they say it. They say Newfoundland and Newfoundlanders, you, you may hear in the video, Newfoundlanders are very unusual people. They're kind of our West Virginia of Canada, all right? So they're, they're kind of our hillbillies a little bit. And uh, they have a very unique dialect when they speak. They have a heavy Irish background. And they say things like this. Hey, me, how me, hey, me son, how's you getting on, boy? Are you going down to wherever you get some kippers? Are you going out sailing today, boy? And they're very difficult to understand unless you can really tune it in. And the farther away from the city center you get to the coastline, they call them, um, what do they call them? Uh, I knew they call them newbies, but they call them uh, uh, baymen. That's what it is, baymen. There's townies and baymen. And the baymen, they're really hard to understand. But they're, they're a rugged people. They live out there on that island. Uh, most of them fish for a living for many, many years. Uh, it's an incredible place, beautiful place. You ever get a chance to go, it's very rugged, but very beautiful. And so Newfoundland, so you hear from the Minions. Uh, I've not met Brother Nate Minion. I've talked to him on the phone. I've heard a lot of great things about him. I know the work that he's pastoring. Uh, I've been to that church and preached there. It's a very difficult situation. You pray for them. And then, of course, Brother Clayton. Uh, not, many, not, not many people don't know Brother Clayton, but uh, I know Brother Clayton very well because his son Phil and his son Steve are two of my best friends. And uh, Phil and I went to college together in Canada, so I've known Dr. Clayton. Dr. Clayton's from the Cleveland Baptist Church, where my father-in-law was the pastor. Uh, he held my wife in his arms when she was born, so we've known them a long time. Great ministry, SEA. And then Brother Bork, I know very well as well from Cleveland. Brother Brad Bork, he's got a great work there. So you're supporting some great works, and I thank you for that, continue to do that. And and uh, with Brother Minion being in Canada, I will tell you that our Bearing Precious Seed ministry is going very, very well. We're trying to put the Gospel of John, Book of Romans, into a single booklet. 
and put that in every home in Canada. There are 14 and a half million homes in Canada, 38 million people. We have done 10 and a half million of the 14 and a half million homes in Canada. So we are well on our way to finishing our nation with the gospel. And uh, we just had an offer from Bearing Precious Seed in Milford, just down near Cincinnati there. Uh, they're going to help us with the last 4 million John of Romans. They're going to help produce them at no cost to us. And then we will just have to raise the money for the postage, which will be close to a million dollars Canadian, about $650,000, $700,000 U.S. And we will have finished our entire nation with the gospel. And that community that Brother Minya is in got one about 17 years ago. And so it's been a while, so it's time to start again and reach our nation again. But th thank you for your support, for your prayers. And we ask that you continue to do that as we finish this great project. People have asked, what are you going to do when you finish Canada? Well, we're going to help America. We're going to start trying to reach America. And we already have about 10 or 12 churches that are on their way to reaching their either city, county, or state with the gospel. Just talked to some folks in West Virginia. They're going to reach their entire state. And so it's exciting. We want to be a part of that. We figure if we can do Canada, man, America can do America. And so we're going to help with that. You pray about that. That would be awesome. Now, let me ask you this morning, you've been praying for a month for revival. How many of you would today say, preacher, we really do want to see revival? Hey, put your hand high into the air. I really want to see that. All right, good. Thank you. Put your hands down. I hope you do. I believe we do. But I have to ask this morning, are you prepared to pay the cost of revival? There's a cost to everything, isn't there? There's nothing that's free. We say salvation is free, but being a Christian is going to cost you something. It's going to cost you a lifetime of devotion. It's going to cost you some money. It's going to cost you some, uh, maybe sometime reputation. It, it might cost you promotion, but it's going to cost you. Revival is associated with cost. If you want revival, I'm going to beg you to be here tonight and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. I, I'm going to plead with you to try and bring someone with you Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday especially. I'm going to ask you to keep praying. I'm going to ask you to set aside any timidity that you might have. I hope that you'll invite many and that you'll witness to some. Revival comes when Christians are so right with God that they cannot contain the desire to tell others of Jesus Christ. And when they start telling others, others then come to find Christ. And that spirit begins to multiply and multiply till many are saved and great changes me. We've not seen that in our countries for a very long time. We've not seen it for most of us in our lifetime. I am desperate to see revival. I believe Jesus is coming soon. Don't you? Amen. I believe COVID has shown us that. When I was a kid, and maybe you're the same way, when I was a kid, I never dreamed that people would actually line up and get the mark of the beast. How would they ever do that? How would you ever get people convinced to do that? Well, I think we saw, especially in Canada, how they would do that. They said, if you don't do this, you're going to die. If you don't do this, your family may die. If you don't do this, you're not going to work anymore. And they said, line up for a vaccination or those things will happen. And you know what? 90% of our population lined up to get that shot. They were fearful. And that's how it'll happen with the mark of the beast. They'll tell people, if you don't do this, bad things are going to happen. If you don't do this, you're not going to be able to move ahead in life. We see some things changing. Canada has, for a long time, uh, not used a lot of paper currency. We still have it. But we can see the coming of a digital currency. Our prime minister just signed a deal with the Netherlands to be the first two countries that will do digital banking between them. It's coming. A digital banking is a global banking. It is a paperless banking. And we say, well, we'd never do that. Well, if you're using a credit card, you're doing it. <laughs> because you're not using paper. You're using plastic. You're using a number. And folks, it's coming. I believe Jesus is coming. And if we're going to see our friends and our family and our co-workers come to know Christ, we better get at it now because I believe the time is so, so very short. Let's look this morning at revival by defined Christian life. Take your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 11. I thought about revival over the last few months. I've studied it for years. And I've seen what it's taken to have revival. And I've studied what the Bible says about it. And, and I've gotten to a place where I believe that we're not seeing revival in Canada, the United States, and many parts of the world. Because 
we need to redefine the Christian life. There are a lot of people that are living a Christian life that aren't Christian. There are a lot of people living a Christian life that aren't participating in the Christian values of the Christian life. So I'm going to start very basic this morning, and we're going to build on this with each service, but a a revival defined by a Christian life, first of all, this morning requires a Bible-based conversion. A Bible-based conversion. If I stopped 10 people on the streets of this city and asked, are you a Christian? Many would answer, yes. But sadly, most of them would have no idea what I was really asking. Are you a Christian? The term Christian in our nations of Canada and the United States is a very broad term. It's a very loosely used term. The term Christian has been taken by many to mean, do you go to church? Do you go to church? Well, there'd be a lot of people say, yeah, I go to church. I go to weddings and I go to funerals and I go to Christmas and I go at Easter. We call those C&E Christians, Christmas and Easter. I go to church. I mean, my family went to church. I was baptized as a baby in a church. I, 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 I'm accustomed to going to that place. Some would say that it meant that you accept the teachings of a denomination. Our family has always been, and you put the denomination in there, we've always been Catholic. We've always been Presbyterian. We've always been whatever. And maybe for some it would be Baptist. I mean, my family, my great, great grandpa was a Baptist preacher. And so therefore I am a Christian because my great, great grandfather was a Baptist preacher and we go to a Baptist church for some. It's, it's something other than Muslim, Buddhist, or atheist. Are you a Christian? Well, I'm not a Buddhist, so I must be a Christian. I'm not a Muslim, so I must be a Christian. And for some, you live in a country that was founded or given to biblical foundations. America and Canada would say we are Christian nations. Could I tell you that that is quickly changing and is not necessarily the case? In Canada, we are taking in 450,000 immigrants a year, many of them coming from Muslim nations, and the Muslim population in our nation, in our nation is growing exponentially. I just saw a church that closed in our town and has now become an Islamic center in our city of St. Thomas. That troubles me. It doesn't trouble me because I'm afraid of them. It troubles me because there's such a population and we're not doing much about it. Could I tell you that the Islamic population of Canada, the United States, needs Jesus Christ as their Savior? They don't realize that. They might fight against that, but that's the truth. And some people don't like immigration, but I say this of immigration. It brings the world to us. And we don't necessarily have to go to them. We still do, but they're coming to us and learning our culture, learning our, our language living beside us, and we have an opportunity to be missionaries within our own countries. The truth of the matter is the term Christian has a very narrow definition. Very narrow. The first time we use it and see it is found in Acts chapter 11. Would you look there at verses 25 and 26? It says, Then departed Barnabas and Tarsus for to seek Saul. And we have found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. The the name Christian was given somewhat flippantly or even derogatorily by these powers that be a sort of dismissive wave of the hand to those little Christs. Those people that worship there together, those little Christs, those Christians Technically, the ending I-A-N means belonging to the party of. So Christians meant those of the party of Jesus. We would say they're part of the Republican Party or Democratic Party, the Republican Party, the Christian Party. They belong to Jesus. They follow his teachings. They're, they're, They're sought after by him. And so the term was not a great term. It wasn't one of high praise, those Christians. And today, in some places, that still holds true. The disciples, the converted and convinced followers of Christ, were called Christians. Those who followed and promoted Christ's new birth were called Christians. But let me ask you this. Look right here at me. Would you look right here? Look right into my eyes. Back row to the front. Let me ask you this morning. Are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? I'm not talking about tradition. I'm not talking about ancestry. I'm not talking about convenience. Are you a Christian by the measure of the Bible? 
I can tell you this morning without any hesitation, I am a Christian. You might use the term born again believer of Jesus Christ. There was a point in my life where I gave my life explicitly to the Lord Jesus Christ, to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. I was going to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am going to be one who is bent on all things Jesus Christ. He will lead me. He will help me. He will be my Savior. He'll be my guide. He'll be my hope in all matters of life, especially eternal life. I am a Christian. How many of you this morning would say with a hearty amen, I am a Christian? I'm glad you are. Now let's take a test and find out if you really are. Really are. Let's find out if those in your life really are Christians. Because there may be some in your life today, in your family, in your friendship, in your fellowships, that, that say they're Christians, but they're really not by a Bible standard. And if they're not by the Bible standard, then they need to be saved. They need to know Christ, or they are lost and on their way to an eternity of separation from God in a place called Hell. Let's take the test right now and determine just who here is a Christian. The scripture makes very clear, number one, that Christians are born again. Would you go to John chapter 3 with me this morning? John chapter 3, Christians are born again. We're going to read verses 1 to 7, very familiar story, a man of Nicodemus, and see his conversion to Christ. In John chapter 3, verse 1, it says, There was a man of the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, the political, the legal leaders of the day, named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be what? Born again. Say it with me again. Born again. That's an important term. That's a term that some have shunned. That's one that some are a little skeptical of. Born again. I, I know some that have even taken and twisted it. There was a time when you could rent a born again car. It was in an accident, they fixed it up, and then they would rent it to you. It was born again. That's not what that born again means. Born again, as it sounds. It's like life ended, and we started again. And that's what Jesus says. You've got to come to that place in your life. You must be born again, or he cannot see. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him in verse 4, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said again, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Being born of the water, we have a young couple here this morning sitting over here to my left. They just have a, a brand new baby little girl. They came in this morning, and uh, they walked in, and I said to the pastor, they just had a baby, didn't they? And he said, how do you know? I said, they're dog tired. Look at them, the poor people are so tired. <laughs> That's not true. But they came in and had that beautiful little baby girl. That baby girl was born of water. When a woman has a baby, they break the water that gives a, a, a smoother birth passage to the baby, and that's the, the, the life of the flesh. And Jesus said, if you're going to enter into the kingdom of God, you've got to be born of the flesh. And then he says, you've got to be born of the spirit. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. We don't understand that spiritual part of our lives. Now, I'm going to say this, and I'll probably say it many times throughout these next few days, but I, I believe this is where the trouble has come for us in, uh, come for us in the last few years. There was a time in, in, in our histories where many people understood being born again. People today don't understand that so much. And here's the reason why. It's kind of like Peter and Paul. Peter went out, he, he went out and preached to the, the Jews, didn't he? And, and he had some great conversions and saw some great things happen because the Jews have been raised their whole life to believe that there is a God. And he is the almighty God. And if you don't worship that God, you don't have the hope of eternal life. So the Jews had kind of that head start of believing there is a God. Then you have Paul who goes to the Gentile nations who did not know God. He goes to Greece, he goes to Athens, and, and, and he sees all these, all these gods, and then there's one that's there that has no name. Remember that story? And he said, who is this? Well, this, this is the God that just in case we missed a God. And he said, this is the God you need. This is the one that you don't know. Could I say that for many of us who are maybe 50 and older, could I say that many of us grew up knowing who God was? I heard it in school. 
We, we heard it in our political arenas. We heard it in our homes. I mean, we all had coffee table Bibles. We all had the lineage of the family in the Bible. We all went to Sunday school for some time. And then we come to a generation today that's not had that. We have a generation today who's being raised in our public school system to believe that there is no God. We evolved. When I was a kid, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You, go, you have kids raised today. We just came about by some miraculous bang. The molecules just began to spin. And we came out of the water as tadpoles and grew legs and stood up on the earth. And that's what they're being taught. And there's no God associated with that. There's no God. And so we have a generation today of people my age and younger who have a a very difficult time understanding the spiritual because all they know is the flesh. So how do we get those people like Nicodemus, who was a religious leader, who should have known exactly what Jesus was talking about? That's where we kind of meld the two into this generation today. How do we get people today to understand that there is the flesh and there is the spirit? You ask people today, where are you going to go when you die? Most people have no idea what to tell you. They may jokingly say heaven or hell. They might take a a whim on that. They still know those terms, but they really don't know. And here's a man who should have known who doesn't know. In verse 6, he says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say to thee, ye must be born again. Nicodemus identifies Jesus as a teacher from God, a miracle worker. But he alludes calling Jesus, who he really was, the Messiah the Savior. The Jews have been waiting since really Adam and Eve. In the beginning of time when God said, I I will send he who will crush the head of the serpent. The serpent will bruise his heel. He introduces that a Savior will come and from that time of creation to the time of, of this Nicodemus, they're looking for the Messiah. I've, I've told you I go to Israel every February and I'd love for some of you to come someday and, and we'll stand at the western wall. And we'll hear the Jews cry, Mishaya, Mishaya. They're looking for the Messiah to come. They missed that he was already here. And so this Nicodemus is part of that crowd. He's going to the, the Western Wall. He's going to the temple area. And he's crying for the Messiah to come. And here is the Messiah right here in front of him. But he doesn't want to say it. He doesn't want to allude to that. Because that's a, that's a serious accusation. That's a, that's a serious statement. And he holds off on saying that, though I believe he believes it in his heart. Like many religious people, he knew of Christ. He was enamored with his teachings and miracles, but did not want to completely identify with Christ just yet. There are many in your life today, I'm sure, would say, I believe there's a God. That's as far as it goes. There are many in your life today that say, I don't know if there is a God. And there are some in your life today that would say, there is no God. And so that's where we're at. Jesus confronted with this one who knows of God and believes in God, but doesn't really receive Christ as Savior yet, says you must be born again. Jesus, knowing all this, cuts to the chase in verse 7 and tells him, you must, you must, there's no no other way, you must be born again. Jesus' words, not mine, not this church, Jesus said, you must. If you're here today and you're thinking, man, I've always come to this church, I must be a Christian, you're not a Christian. If you say, well, my family, you know, has a a deep religious background and I followed in that, you're not a Christian. If you say, well, I've come and I I sing the songs and and I've even come and prayed and I get money in the plate. If you've not been born again, you are not a Christian. That's what the Bible says. Jesus made clear that the new birth is a spiritual birth. And that brings a noticeable change. Now let me ask you today, those who would say, I am a Christian, has there been a change in your life since you found Jesus? There's been a change in my life. I got saved at nine years of age. I've had had 50 years of changing in the things of Jesus Christ. And as a Christian, we ought to be constantly changing, constantly growing in the things of Jesus Christ. And so we start that journey, and every day, every week, every year, there ought to be a change in our lives. You ought to be more for Jesus Christ today than you've ever been before. If there's no change, I have to doubt your salvation. If there's no change, I have to doubt that you've been born again, because there is a noticeable change in those who do receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. 
It's coming to a full realization that without recognizing, accepting, and calling on Jesus to save your soul, you do not have the promise of eternal life with Christ in heaven. Without that, you cannot claim the title Christian or little Christ. Being born again takes you from the darkness of sin and absence of light into the light because we see next that, number two, Christians walk in the light. So today you say, I'm born again, I'm a believer, I, I, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I must ask, are you walking in the light? Look at 1 John chapter 1 with me. Go back towards the back of your Bible just before the book of Revelation. 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude. 1st John chapter 1, we're going to read verses 5 to 9. Christians walk in the light. Verse 5 says, This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you all that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most serious crimes and secret meetings, and we see that of Nicodemus, happen at night. They happen at night. Most places where sins of fornication take place are dimly lit. I did a ride along with a policeman friend who told me, come on a Friday night. He told me, come on a Friday night in the summer when it's hot. He told me, come on a Friday night in the summer when it's hot and there's a full moon. And look out, we're going to have a great time. And so I did. I planned it up just to that specification. The darkness in our text speaks to the evil that happens in the darkness. And that night when I rode along with him, I saw a different society than I see in the daytime. I saw a different group of people. It's almost like cockroaches that come out at night, right? I saw those that have given their lives to crime. I saw those that are giving their lives to drugs, to, to uh, prostitution, to abuse, to hatred, to, to uh, wickedness. And I saw a different society, and I rode with him, and I said, man, this is, this is different. This is, this is something we don't see in the light. He said, that's right. He said, unfortunately, we see the same people almost repeatedly. They work at the night, in the night. We have in our town a uh, growing population of homeless people. And we have seen a rise in the crime in our city with that coming of that homeless uh, group of people. I live in a, a nice neighborhood. God blessed us to be able to live in a nice place. And, and uh, uh, our neighbors all have cameras. I don't have any cameras on my house. I figure if people want to take my stuff, they're going to take it whether I can see them or not. And if I catch them, then I'm probably going to do much anyway. So they all have cameras. And we have a Facebook page, as many neighborhoods do now. And it's kind of comical sometimes. And I saw a spoof on it, actually. And people are you know, reporting, your cat is in my lawn. And, and your kids are on my driveway. And all these other things. So they post these videos of people stealing bicycles and going into their, uh, you know, their sheds in the backyard and taking their stuff, all that kind of stuff. And it's always at night. It's always at night under the cover of darkness. When the lights come on and the cockroaches run, light reveals, light erases the fear of darkness. God, who is all good, is called the light. And you cannot have darkness when the light is on. We could get this room as dark as we possibly could. We could go to a, a room with no windows, turn off all the lights, cover the exit signs. We could do all that. And if you light a match somewhere in that room, it is almost going to fill this entire room with that light. Light erases darkness. And as long as you have a light on, you cannot have complete darkness. Those who say they are Christians are identified here as those who walk in the light. If you say you are a Christian and you willfully and wantonly continue in the darkness of sin, God says you're a liar if you call yourself a Christian. If you keep running back to that, have a pleasure in that, if you seek that and, and can have no conscience of that, there's something wrong with your statement that you're a Christian. 
As a Christian, I want to draw closer to the light. I want more of the light in my life. I want my light to so shine in this dark world that they can see Christ. And our light is a reflection. It's the moon, not the sun. The moon reflects light. I love a full moon. I love when it's a clear night, you have a full moon, you can see all the, all the indentations in the moon. You can see the face on the moon. I love those nights. And, and, and it gives you, if it's the right night, you can see clearly from the moonlight. And that's what we're supposed to be. A reflection of the light of Jesus Christ. And if you're in the darkness, that light doesn't shine the same way. And we have a lot of Christians today say, yes, I want revival. Yes, I want to see God do something. But they are so saturated with the darkness of this life. Folks, if we're going to have revival, we need to start getting rid of some sin from our lives. When's the last time you took tally of the sins of your life? Someday, would you do this? Would you take a piece of paper, and as you go through the day, would you mark on that paper every time you have a wrong thought? Would you mark on that paper every time you look at something on a screen that you ought not look at? Would you mark on that piece of paper the number of times that you listen to something that you ought not listen to? Would you mark on that paper the number of times that you don't read your Bible when you should have or pray when you should have? I'll tell you what, it won't be long before that page is filled with a number of things that we don't even think about. Now, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but I'm a little heavier than I should be. You probably didn't even notice because I wear really big clothes that wrap around me two or three times. Now, I, I struggle with weight. So it's a problem I have, and I, and I work at it and try, and I've just struggled with that. So at one point, I had a lady in my church that did Weight Watchers. Anybody ever do Weight Watchers? You don't have to raise your hand, if you, but if you did, give me the, give me the sign, okay? Um, <laughs> she came to me, she said, Pastor, I can help you lose weight. And I said, I'm going to be honest with you. Her name was Ruth. I said, Ruth, I'm going to be honest with you. I do not want to go to a room full of women and say, hi, my name's Al, and I'm fat. I don't want to do that. I can't do it. I can't step on those scales and say, yay, I, I lost a half a pound. I, I can't do it. She said, Pastor, I will come to your office. I will bring my scale. We'll do it together. I said, all, all right. So she did. And I lost 25 pounds. It was amazing. But here's what she said. If you nibble it, you got to scribble it. If you bite it, you got to write it. Everything you put in your mouth, she said, if you put a tic-tac in your mouth, you got to write down how many calories that was and mark that down. I'm telling you, you do not realize how much food you put in your mouth in a day until you start writing it down. I happened to look last night. I hadn't eaten all day, and I'm trying to keep track, calories and all that kind of stuff. And I looked, and that hamburger right last night was enough calories for an entire day. I'm glad I didn't eat, eat anything else. And then it gives you even more when you get heartburn in the night and eat it again. It's terrible. If we wrote down the number of times that we step into the darkness out of the light, it, it'd scare us. We are not, not going to see revival until Christians say, I'm done with sin, I'm going to have complete victory over sin, and I'm going to walk in the light of Jesus Christ. If you're saying you want it, you better be prepared to pay that price. There is nothing eerier than being alone in the dark. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie because he is the light. So if you say you have, uh, you're, that you're a Christian, but, but you make no effort to leave the darkness of sin and continue to run without fear and darkness, you're not a Christian. A Christian will confess their sins because God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then we see this finally. We see this, in, uh, Christians openly testify. Go to 2 Timothy, we'll be done here in just a moment. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 to 12. Be thou therefore ashamed, be, thou not, be not thou there ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoners, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I have appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher to, of the Gentiles. For we which cause, I'm sorry, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and have persuaded the blessed persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. 
Who do you cheer most and loudest for in this life? The Browns? The tribe? Maybe not a great examples. Not a great examples. Who do you cheer for? We, we all have things that we cheer for. Uh, uh, somebody asked me, are you following the Stanley Cup playoffs? No, because the Canadian teams are all out. Once the Canadian teams are out, we stop cheering. Though everybody who's playing is Canadian, that, that doesn't count. All right. But I do have a team I cheer for. I cheer for the Toronto Maple Leafs because they live closest to me, and that kind of identifies our area, and they are Canada's team and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I, I do cheer for them. I'm not a great fan because uh, I only cheer for them in the playoffs. I don't follow them every game of the season, you know, all over the place, those kind of things. But we cheer for things. A Christian, someone who realizes that Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty of their sin in their place, cheers about that, heralds that, lets people know that. I'm not ashamed of that. We're always proudest when our team is winning. But as a Christian, I know that we never fail. As a Christian, I know that we're going to win. As a Christian, I know that we might lose some battles in this life. But overall, we're going to win the war. I read at the back of the book, and we win. <laughs> we win. So I can do that. I herald Jesus Christ. I tell people I'm a Christian. I'm not ashamed to let people know that I've been born again. I became a chaplain for our fire department. If you ever get a chance to do that for the fire or police department, it's an awesome opportunity to reach guys that really need the gospel, and ladies today too. And uh, I was out at a function the other night. They had a retiree's banquet, and they asked if I would come and if I would pray for the meal. Now, most of those guys are not God-fearing Christians, i got to tell you that. Most of them have very little uh, understanding of the Word of God. Uh, some of them do go to church, but not all. And so I took it as an opportunity to be able to give the gospel. And so I was standing there, and uh, uh, most of them uh, drink alcohol. I don't. I never have. I, I don't plan on it. I won't. I don't think it's good for Christians to do it. And so uh, I was standing there, and I had a, a Coke in my hand. And they said, oh, did you get a drink? And I said, I'm drinking pop. That's all I ever drink, pop and water. That's all I drink, fruit juice. I said, I don't drink alcohol. And they said, really? And I said, nope, never needed it, don't need it, don't want it. And here's what they said. Three of the guys said, man, we wish we could be like you. I said, you can. I said, you know what makes a difference? I have Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I have a hope and a cleansing of Christ that gives me a brand new life. And I don't need that life in Christ, that life without Christ. I live Christ. What an opportunity. What an opportunity. Unashamedly, they cheer on and cheer for the Lord Jesus Christ, those who understand who he is. They, they wear his shirt. They show up for the game. In good times and bad, they cheer Christ. They persuade any and all who will join the team. And when heckled or mocked, they stay the course because Christ is everything and all. Let me ask you this morning. When's the last time you cheered for Jesus? When's the last time you told other people, I'm on team Jesus? When's the last time you wore the t-shirt as, as it were and said, hey, listen, I want to tell you, for God's so love the world, that he gave his only begotten son for you. When's the last time you said, hey, God is love and God loves you. When's the last time? When's the last time that you openly displayed your love and affection for him? When's the last time you stood up and out for the one who saved your sorry, sin-sick soul? Unashamedly. Christians to the death, verse 12 tells us, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. Paul said, I'm not ashamed. I, I've been in prison, I've been beaten, I've been left for dead, and I will not turn from Christ. Are you a Christian? Are you born again? Are you walking in the light? Are you openly testifying that Jesus Christ is the Savior, your Savior? If you are not, Good news. You can. And right now. If you are, but those three things aren't evident and clear in your life, good news. You can make that right. Right now. And leave here today and say, God, I am ready for revival. Help us to do that. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. For this time that we spent together. And Father, I pray that in this place today, if there's one, one person that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, that today they would be able to use that term, Christian. I'm born again. I'm walking in the light. I'm unashamed of Christ because I am a Christian. Father, to become a Christian is so easy. So easy. And to live the Christian life can be so easy if we'll just do those things. Help us today to be all of them. And to be them beyond our imagination so that others might know 
Christ. We want revival. And it begins with all of us knowing that we're Christians and living that Christian life. Help us to do that today. I pray in your holy name. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed this morning. Do something a little bit different today. In a moment, I'm going to have us all stand. In a moment, the piano is going to begin to play when we stand. And this morning, I would like you to do this. If you are saved today, I want you to either come forward and begin praying, God, make me all that I need to be so that I can see revival come through my life. God, you sparked some knowledge of sin in my life today. God, you, you stepped on my toes today about not being the kind of Christian I should be. God, you revealed that I'm walking in some darkness and I need to get to the light. God, you pointed out that I've not been as bold as I should be about my testimony of Christ. Would you come and at this old-fashioned altar, these stairs this morning, the front, these front chairs, would you come and pray and say, God, help me with that today? Or would you remain standing where you're at and pray that prayer today? I'm going to ask some of you today, if you're not saved, if you would come and let someone take a Bible and show you how to be saved today. We're, we're going to ask you to make that, that what seems very difficult step to just step out of where you're at and come and let the pastor take your hand and have someone take a Bible and show you how to be saved today. Listen, if I was dying of cancer today and someone stood at the front of an auditorium and said, I have the cure for cancer, if you'll just come and take it, I'll be running down that aisle. I have something that's greater than a cure for cancer. It's a cure for sin and death. It's the hope of eternal life, Jesus Christ. Come and get him today. And then for the rest that would stand today and pray, would you pray this, Lord, my life, I believe, is right. My life, I believe, is affixed on the things of Christ. I'm walking in the light. I'm unashamed. And God, I pray that this week you would allow me to be able to testify to more people than I've ever tested by before. I pray that you'd allow me to bring people to this church I've never been able to bring before. And God, I pray for revival this week. Let's pray those things. Let's stand to our feet. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. The piano begins to play. If you would like to step out and come this morning, now is your time. Would you come to this altar? Would you bend your knee and say, God, I need your help today. God, you've revealed some things in my life today. Would you help me? Would you do that? If you don't feel comfortable stepping forward this morning where you're standing right now, would you begin to pray? And when you're done praying, you can be seated. Some will think, well, I don't want to be the first to be seated. Don't you worry about that. No one's looking around. I'll let you know when the first person is seated, when other people are seated, and you can join them. If you can't kneel this morning, you can be seated here on these chairs. That's fine. But would you this morning maybe come and say, Lord, I want revival. And I know it begins with me. And I know I've got to get some things right. I know I've got to turn my life around. Lord, I've been too timid. Lord, I've been too shy. I've been too worried about what people will think. I'm afraid of losing friends. I'm afraid of being rejected. And I'm not going to do that anymore. Because we need revival. If Christians won't speak out, we can't have revival. If Christians won't get right, we won't see revival. Pray as long as you wish this morning. We have time when you're done praying. You can be seated. Some have been seated already. Others are being seated. You can be seated when you're done. Take your time. Some still here at the altar. Revival's not going to come in a 30-second prayer. I can tell you that. you're not praying, go ahead and be seated. Others are being seated today. Pray as long as you wish. Let's turn our eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face. God, give us revival. God, move us as Christians to be what we ought to be. Give us opportunity even today tell someone about Jesus. Pastor.